There is nothing but light, so that would be the obvious source of our consciousness because there are only really two things in the universe, light and nothing. Hey, it's Luminostic. Today we're going to do the bi-monthly question and answer uh, video. Um, I want to thank all you guys that asked questions, and also um, last time I checked we were at 999 subscribers. One more will allow us to go into review for monetization, so I want to thank all you guys that have subscribed. Speaking of that, do me a favor and hit the uh, like button, share, subscribe, and uh, support us on Patreon. Okay, so the first question from Mr. Clark Parker, did you ever reach a point where your mind couldn't keep up with the progression of your spirit? I would say most of my life has been, uh, has, has, has more or less fit that description. Uh, but the second half of the question is what did you do about it? I've actually started making the Phoenix Process videos and that uh, basically is a description of what happens when your mind can't find equilibrium with your spiritual development. And um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of factors that can contribute to this. But the most significant one and the most universal is going to be the conditioning that we have from living in the modern society. We have been told that, you know, voices in your head that tell you about future events or that offer guidance in the form of intuition or um, spirits or any of this kind of stuff are not real and that if you're having these experiences that you should be checked out for schizophrenia and probably given a handful of drugs. Um, so when you do have these experiences that contradict uh, what we have accepted as consensus reality, uh, it can create a lot of dissonance in your being. And <clears throat> then as you become increasingly confident that a, a lot of the things that, that you have been told aren't true are true. For example, you know, you experience the synchronicities, you realize that you are able to manifest things that um, are extremely improbable. And in my case, you know, I was asking or intending um, to have like certain types of people and circumstances and all of these things come into my life. And they began to, in this like snowballing fashion that, uh, you know, everything fit a very specific description and it started to seem like I could just manifest anything I thought. And so what happens then is we uh, become inundated with these wish demons, which basically means that these are not real intuitions. Um, they are just, you know, you're believing every thought that you have because you've realized that you sometimes do have correct intuitions. You know, I found Danny Carey from Tool and was able to speak with him just based on sort of emptying my mind and driving, you know, which is just about as impossible as a thing could get, you know. Um, there's a video that I made about that that you can check out. And then as far as, you know, what do you do about it? There are a lot of things that you can do about it. You can um, use different techniques of meditation. I always advocate pranayama as being the most effective because, you know, the breath is a life force and controlling the breath is symbolic of controlling your life. Inundation of oxygen helps the brain to do its job and to create new neural pathways and um, is just, you know, the fuel basically that, that the brain runs on and um, deprivation of oxygen causes altered states and that is where we find, you know, the calm, like uh, uh, when you toss a stone into or a pebble into the water and you get the ripples and then the ripples stop, you can see a clear reflection again. Another really good analogy that I like that I heard from a Buddhist monk was that if you have thrown a rock and it goes whizzing by your face at 40 miles an hour, you can't really tell necessarily exactly what colors it's constituted of. You can't tell what type of mineral it was. You can't tell the exact shape. But when it runs out of energy and it comes to rest and it is still, then you can make these observations. So um, these altered states can help in that way as well. Obviously different types of plants can be a benefit in this way too. Although um, <clears throat> sometimes if you have really pushed your consciousness, it's a good idea to take a break from these things. And it's difficult to, uh, you know, that's kind of a case by case basis and a circumstantial thing. Uh, sometimes it may help and sometimes it may not be appropriate. In my case, I had no teacher, no guide, and I just kind of had to, to feel it out. And I, that's actually not true. I would say that the collective overmind or however you want to talk about it was functioning as a sort of guide for me. But there was certainly no person that I could uh, ask um, or consult during my process, um, which is, of course, ongoing. I still have trouble uh, maintaining the homeostasis between mind and, and, and spirit. Anyone that seriously sets their foot on the path of initiation, no matter 
um, which path of initiation that might be, whether it's in the shamanic plant medicine world or the Western mystery tradition or, you know, any one of the other legitimate paths, uh, you, you will run into a period where, you know, it's been expressed as the dark night of the soul, um, the crossing of the abyss. Uh, there are different terms for it, uh, you know, in Buddhism, in order to avoid, there are some Buddhistic practices in order to avoid getting lost in the abyss. They call them the cities, like uh, powers, like telepathy, uh, remote viewing, all of this stuff. They tell you to just ignore it and don't engage it at all. Um, <clears throat> of course, if you were a Western person that has, you know, a life and you're trying to use this stuff to manifest the, uh, you, to live in your dreams, you know, or to figure out your true will and then to execute it, uh, ignoring all these kind of powers is going to be a very bad idea. So, you know, a lot of how to deal with this is going to depend on context. Um, so I would quote Aleister Crowley and say that he who sticks to meditation is perfectly safe. Uh, that's, that's, that's going to help. And uh, mindfulness, just analyzing what you're doing, why you're doing it, keeping in mind that if you um, <clears throat> believe that you can use your consciousness to override uh, or to negate um, natural law, you are definitely experiencing a symptom of overinflated ego, which or inflated ego, I guess I should say. Um, uh, and that, I should add, is uh, one of the most common pitfalls on the path. Uh, it's one of the, the, the things I always cite when people say, you know, what are the dangerous or the downsides of plant medicine, particularly, I think, anything that contains DMT. I've seen this more often with. Uh, LSD does it sometimes. And you don't have to take anything at all. I know of people that have um, just set out on their, you know, spiritual growth journey and at a certain state especially men will have the experience where they realize their divinity and then they think that they are literally the creator of the entire universe which is not untrue but they have forgotten that they're no more no less this than anyone else there's a huge difference between having a greater awareness of your divinity and actually thinking that your divinity is greater and you know pride always comes before a fall if you go to this place of elevated ego the humbling process trust me i've been through it is uh is going to be very difficult. The next question is from Aitash um, in Turkey. Uh, do star systems have connections to spiritual power? And this question could be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And in the past, meaning, you know, before I had certain visions and experiences, I wouldn't have answered it necessarily because uh, I have this rule, you know, that I'll know my song well until I start singing. <clears throat> and so if this is a question in terms of like astrology, I don't really have an answer because I seriously do question astrologers. It's not that I don't think that um, the position of planetary bodies and stars would have some kind of correspondence to the energetic state of the universe. I think that uh, it could be even correlated to when you take a brain scan and you can tell kind of what's going on in someone's head. Um, because I do think that the uh, hermetic um, principle that the all is mind that we are in a vast sea of consciousness, you know, I mean, I've seen a lot of people come back from DMT experiences and just, you know, when you're asked what, what happened, they'll say, well, it's just a vast sea of consciousness. We're all just in eternal consciousness. So the um, <clears throat> position of everything in relation to everything else, sure, I'm sure it can tell you stuff, but has anyone actually mapped it correctly and figured it out? Why do so many people have so many different interpretations? They can't all be right. Obviously, all Tauruses are not the same. You know, um, although I have to admit there are some kind of eerie similarities. There are a lot of stubborn, tor stubborn Tauruses I've noticed, and you know, that sort of thing. But you know, I will tell you something coming from a slightly different perspective on this. Um, one of the things that I was taught in the mystery schools and through visions, or at least it was suggested to me through visions, you know, I don't necessarily attribute absolute objective reality to anything, and I think it's important to say that. But um, one, uh, I guess, creation story that uh, really resonated with me um, was that basically all of the stars are like fallen angels, um, that they're beings, and that what we experience here is the consciousness of the sun. And so this is something that's been known in the mystery schools for a long time, and this is why, you know, you see those old alchemical pictures from Europe uh, from the dark ages or the middle ages or whenever it was and they, they always have like a face on the sun It's not mythological. It's a it's an objective reality that the sun is a being also I have good reason to believe that uh, Intelligences from other star systems 
sometimes transmit information to us here. In fact, the entire um, star family experience and the Phoenix, a lot of the Phoenix process videos um, kind of revolve around this idea and related experiences that I've had along those lines. In the video, uh, The Power of Ritual and Ceremony, towards the end, uh, there are minute markers in the description as well, um, and I'll put a card. Uh, I talk about one of the experiences that I had that kind of helped to um, <clears throat> encourage me to sort of take this idea seriously that, that the stars could be living beings. In fact, I mean, I'm not alone in this. Uh, uh, th there are a lot of physicists that now believe that all matter may very well be conscious. And if the theory that all matter is light in a standing wave, um, you know, there is nothing but light. So that would be the obvious source of our consciousness because there are only really two things in the universe, light and nothing. A lot of people have alluded to this too, you know, just as like a random example, uh, the, the, the rock artist uh, Modest Mouse, one of his songs, he says, you know, the stars are projectors. Uh, the Grateful Dead song Ripple, the first couple of lines, I think, are kind of a thinly veiled reference to this idea. Uh, the answer to the question, it, it kind of depends on the, what you mean exactly by this. Um, so thanks, Itosh. I think we have another question. Oh, how do you develop the body of light? Um, this is also a question from Itosh. Um, the body of light is uh, kind of goes along with what we're saying here. Is be be a, a body made of pure consciousness. A lot of people say that the Merkaba, the, the chariot of light, is actually how uh, interdimensional beings and alien beings get around the universe. Because if you can transubstantiate, move at speed at the speed of light, um, theoretically time would stop, and so you would not experience any passage of time as you zipped around from star system to star system. So. The process for developing the astral body or the body of light, and this could be very useful for anyone that's you know smoking high doses of DMT. If you want to be able to navigate this space a little bit more consciously, and also it kind of prepares you to go into I think any plant medicine space. And the basic process for developing it in the beginning is very simple, but the process for having control in the astral plane is kind of a different story. So the process to begin is um, as simple as sitting and meditating until you can visualize yourself sitting there and you separate the light body in the mind's eye from the physical body and send it around the room trying to engage in simple tasks. And uh, one of the ways to test, it's very important to test this stuff because you don't want to just sit around believing that you're doing these things just because you want to. Um, you want certainty, not faith. And so <clears throat> you can set up tests, you can uh, have other people arrange some circumstances in another room, send the astral body into the other room, and if it can uh, ascertain things correctly and accurately, then you know that you have made progress in developing the astral body in terms of remote viewing. If you are going out on the astral plane, so the astral plane is you know, basically a term for, at least in my opinion, the infinite sea of consciousness, which is the realm that you go on a strong dose of DMT. It basically rips the veil between worlds or turns the reducing valve in our consciousness, as Aldous Huxley uh, termed it, um, totally off, so that we're basically on the astral plane. And because the mind works in symbols, so does the astral plane. So for example, you could say, I'm gonna invoke Mercury, and I'm gonna deal with the energy, the consciousness associated with the idea of Mercury and you're going to go out in the astral plane and you're going to see if you see you run into entities and uh, symbols that are all consistent with Mercury and that archetype of consciousness. So that's basically it. You just have to sit and meditate and visualize these things. And a lot of people say, well, isn't that just your imagination? And um, I would say, you know, it, 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 this is all our imagination on some level. Um, and it doesn't ultimately really matter because you are still developing a discipline that is going to help you master the mind, that is going to help you organize your thoughts. And so it has pragmatic functions, whether there's actually any real magical or um, objective reality to the body of light in the astral plane. Okay, and the last question for this video is, are the DMT entities real, and are they the same as the Jungian archetypes from Jan Schottner? Um, they are real, but they are not real in the way that the IRS is real, to quote uh, Robert Anton Wilson. This is a complicated subject for me, and I don't think that anyone can really know for sure what these things are. I mean, a lot of people say, well, there's just no way that the human mind could uh, create these experiences. And um, 
I was reading a study a little while ago that was saying that the, the brain actually like builds itself in 11 dimensions or something, they think. And so even though we don't have experiences that would um, necessitate or would be conducive to thinking in 11 dimensions, it seems like the brain has the capacity to function in more dimensions that we consciously understand. So to say that these entities are real based on just disbelief that the human mind is capable of generating something like that doesn't really hold any water at all. I mean, I understand why people say that, but I don't think it's really a valid argument. What I do think may be a valid argument is that, you know, in my own experience, um, and I talk about this in the DMT, uh, in the Synchronicities, Entities, and Prophecy video, if it's correct that there is no really linear time, everything's already happened and we're just sort of experiencing it this way because of some, you know, something in our brain or, you know, whatever it may be. So time is not, and um, all is consciousness. When these entities give me information that they couldn't possibly know, that is 100% accurate, then I start to consider maybe their objective reality, but still, if everything is consciousness, there is no time, there's no reason why my brain could not link into the mainframe and extract this information without the help of these entities. Uh, one argument <clears throat> that I think kind of argues in favor of them is that they seem to have a role in mitigating what information comes in. Because if this thing about you know having a reducing valve in our nervous system that screens out, keeps this overload of information from coming in, it would stand to reason that if you turn that valve off, it would all come rushing in at once and your head would blow up or whatever. And that's not what happens. What happens is a praying mantis or um, something like a praying mantis or a jester or some sort of being that seems archetypal, and no, not in the Jungian sense at all. Um, I'm just going to answer that part of the question in the middle of this, I guess, because it came up. Um, there's absolutely no relationship that I can see between the DMT entities and the Jungian archetypes. The, there's no correlation at all whatsoever. I think one way to think about it is the, the Jungian archetypes, um, yeah, I mean, there may be some kind of correlation, but I guess what I'm saying is that it seems that there is like, those archetypes in the, the human consciousness and whatever these other archetypes are, represent archetypal consciousness from other types of beings. So the Jungian archetypes are specifically human, and the Mantoids are representatives or archetype, archetypal forms of consciousness that are representing the insect mind. And then you have, um, you know, the, the metallic bees and, and the jesters that all represent some other type of non-human archetypal consciousness. Uh, so it's a distinctly different thing. And I think the part of the function of these archetypes of consciousness is that whole idea of screening out you know we brought the filters down but we still can't just have everything rushing in so usually when we're given this information in hyperspace for the dmt realm it is given to us by one of these beings so it seems that the function of these beings is almost to like uh, the same as the reducing valve in uh, the nervous system they sort of mitigate what information and how much of it comes through at any given time so um i think it would be I would be out of line to try to answer whether or not these beings are fundamentally real, whether they have their own objective existence, because I don't think that anyone can answer that question. But I think that the idea of thought forms, which is um, an idea from the mystery schools, that basically um, <clears throat> ideas, especially if they're shared by like a very large group of people, can sort of take on a semi-substantial form and have some sort of effect. And this is kind of what spirits are. And I would say the same thing about spirits. I don't know that they have any objective experience of their own. These could still be projections of our consciousness that have a function. They seem to be animated of their own, um, of their own accord or, you know, have their own objective existence. But uh, I don't think it really matters in the long run. The reality is that I have seen beings um, both with ayahuasca, without any drugs at all. I've had encounters with things that are very difficult to explain and that were witnessed even by multiple people. Um, but I'm not entirely convinced that they're not somehow projections of mind. So I don't think that we really should spend too much time even being concerned with that. I think what they're teaching us and the information that's coming is of fundamental importance. And I think that our purposes are best suited by just being open to the possibility that, you know, wow, these things seem like they could be real, and that is really interesting. 
and it implies a lot of other things that are also very interesting but you just have to kind of come to terms with the fact that we may never know and um that's the journey you know as far as i'm concerned the, the universe's purpose is just to create these experiences and uh to experience itself from every possible perspective and once all of those perspectives and uh, possibilities have been exhausted um, the light will consume itself, it collapses in, and there's another big bang and the whole thing starts over again, which is why the Phoenix process is so important. I'm going to have that video out next for sure, so do us a favor and watch those. Like, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon, and we'll see you next time.